Well, thank you to Ed and Jeff for inviting me here tonight. Uh, this is part of my farewell tour to the United States. Um, my wife and I have put the band together like the Blues Brothers and we're <laughs> having a last couple of gigs before we head back to Australia. This is after spending 18 and a half years at Liberty Fund in Indianapolis. And one of my jobs there, in addition to uh, building the online library of Liberty website, but it was also, I was also involved in um, editing Liberty Fund's uh, translation project of the collected works of Frederick Bastiat. And uh, that uh, <clears throat> experience of delving deeply into the thought of Bastiat in a way I'd never done before uh, has produced um, some ideas about um, what I think is the most important aspect of his thinking, this polarity between the two ideas of harmony and disharmony. And that's the, the subject of my talk uh, tonight. So here's a picture of the man. Um, it's interesting, that I've heard of surround sound but not surround vision. Um, <laughs> so I might get confused about which uh, picture I should be pointing to. But that's a picture of the man. Um, and one of the things that struck me, and this is a, the front page of my personal website where you can find um, the paper that this talk is based upon uh, in PDF as well as the, the slides that you see here tonight. Um, the paper that I've written on um, this polarity between harmony and disharmony is um, a, a part of a book that I'm trying to write. It's, it, it, the draft I have online is about 300 pages. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there are many other things, other resources on the website to do with uh, the history of the classical liberal tradition and the French uh, component of that in particular. So this is the title page of um, Bastiat's best-known theoretical work, The Economic Harmonies. And the story behind this is, is really quite tragic because, and I'll just give you a brief outline of his life. Um, for, he was born in 1801 in a, in a small um, port town, Bayonne, in the southwest of France near the Spanish border. And uh, he became um, a country gentleman and uh, was very intellectually curious and had a, a book club, a discussion group with the, his neighbours in this small town of Mougron where he owned land and where he worked as a local magistrate. And uh, in his book club, they discussed you know, recent literature but also uh, politics. And he came across some articles in a paper that they wanted his colleagues and neighbours wanted to discuss about the anti-corn law league in England, um, which was led by Richard Cobden. And this was the movement to abolish tariffs and other forms of protection in England and to usher in, in, uh, into in, um, free trade as a policy which would dominate Britain for the rest of the 19th century. And this inspired Bastiat uh, to get an interest in economics and he began reading. And uh, he did so in, in a private capacity. He didn't have any degree in um, economic thought. He just read it uh, for interest. And because of where he lived and where he grew up, he was fluent in four different languages. Of course, French was his uh, native language, although he, didn't, he spoke a particular kind of French. He spoke Gascon French. And w so when he went to Paris and he started speaking to uh, the Parisian economists who were very quite strong in Paris, they all laughed at his country accent and his country clothes and his bumpkin-like demeanour. Um, but um, he, he could read, um, and he did read, widely all the economic literature he could get in English, French, Spanish and Italian. And uh, he did this for 22 years. So he was a nobody in terms of um, intellectual recognition until um, 1844. So he was 43 years old and uh, he had been reading about the anti corn League and about tariff policy and so on and he became an ardent free trader and wanted to introduce free trade to France. And he thought, to do that, I would have to become like Richard Cobden and start my own free trade movement and launch a propaganda and lobbying movement to try and bring about free trade in France. And uh, he, he, over the summer of 1844, he wrote a lengthy article examining um, French and English trade policies and came out very strongly in favour of free trade. He then sent it off... Uh, without uh, being invited to, um, to the leading French economic journal of the day, the Journal des Economistes. And uh, no one paid any attention in the editorial offices of the Journal des Economistes because this was a nobody from the southwest of France and why should they bother reading an unsolicited manuscript? Eventually one of the editors did and was gobsmacked. 
at the extraordinary intelligence and uh, theoretical arguments and the uh, sophisticated use of data um, that this person had uh, shown in the article. So it was eventually published in um, October of 1844 and he was invited, uh, Bastiat was then invited to come to Paris and to be introduced into the circle of political economists who were uh, organised around the Guillaume publishing firm. And the Guillaume publishing firm is the, the locus of um, intellectual uh, activity for the free market people and for the libertarians and classical liberals of the day. Uh, it's an extraordinary publishing firm. They launched in 1837 and eventually were taken over by another company in 1907. And in the course of that very long period of time, this publishing firm published 2,500 books on free market economics. Quite extraordinary. Um, and when the original founding um, publisher, Guillaume, his name was Felix, when he died in 1864, it was run by his two daughters. So we have this quite interesting um, uh, event of two women running a, a large publishing firm. And no one's ever written about this. I mean, if anyone here is interested in doing a PhD, you should do one on the Guillaume daughters. Um, this would be an entree into politically correct um, economics departments. <laughs> So I strongly recommend that to you. Anyway, um, Bastia does eventually launch um, a free trade movement and becomes the president of it, the main organiser, the editor and main writer of their um, weekly newspaper. Um, he's a public speaker. They have large public meetings all over France agitating for free trade. This is in the period from 1846 to 47. Um, and this is what Bastia is best known for today. Um, the articles, the short articles that he wrote for his free trade magazine, many of those ended up um, being collected into a volume called The Economic Sophisms, uh, one of which appeared in 1846, another one appeared in 1848. And uh, that economic journalism, written uh, from the perspective of free trade and demolishing the arguments of the protectionists, is what uh, got Bastia his reputation. Um, Joseph Schumpeter, the great historian of economic thought who was writing in the, in the 1950s, described Bastia as perhaps the greatest economic uh, journalist the world has ever seen. And that is, um, I think, in many ways justified, except I think maybe Don Boudreau now has taken that crown. Um, but his, his uh, particular strength is the letter to the editor. That's what he has mastered. And uh, if you had, don't know Don Boudreau's Café Hayek, you should look at that and read his letters to the editor. He's a modern-day Bastia. So if this wasn't enough activity for Bastia, when the revolution broke out in, 18, in February of 1848, uh, he, was he was in Paris at the time and decided to run for parliament for the, to the National Assembly and um, was elected and then became the vice president of the finance committee. And now, the, France is in revolution, right? One of the, the, the surprise results of the elections was this, the rise of socialist groups. So there was now a double-barreled attack on liberal principles. There were the traditional protectionists who were mainly conservative landowners and manufacturers. And now you have this rising group of organised uh, socialists uh, attacking uh, also liberal principles. And Bastia took both of them on at the same time. In the course of the revolution, uh, before his death, uh, premature death in 1850, he wrote over a dozen anti-socialist pamphlets, uh, which the Guillaume firm published and were distributed widely. They were done in cheap format so that they were uh, affordable to ordinary people. Bastiat and his friend uh, and colleague, um, Gustave de Molinari, twice during the uh, peak of the revolution in 1848, in February and June, <laughs> published a um, little newspaper which they, advocating free market ideas and challenging socialist ideas, which they handed out in the streets of Paris to ordinary working people. Um, this is quite an extraordinary thing um, because both times, um, in February and June of that year, Bastiat came under fire from the troops who were trying to suppress the rioting that was going on in the streets. And because Bastiat was um, a member of parliament, he was able to, he wore a parliamentary badge to indicate his um, status and uh, at one stage he was able to uh, approach the uh, officer in charge of some of the troops firing uh, people on the barricades in the streets of Paris to arrange a truce so they could pull the dead and the injured and dying off the barricades into the side streets so they could get attention. 
So Bastiat is not just a, a journalist, he's also active in these revolutionary politics of the day, uh, which is, a, I think, an interesting aspect of his character. While this is going on, he's a free trade uh, journalist, he's a, a politician, he's active in the streets during the French Revolution. He's also trying to develop himself as an economic theorist. One of the things he knew when he came to Paris in 1844-45 was that he had a book in his head just waiting to be let loose. He'd been thinking about economics for over 20 years and had all these original ideas floating around in his mind. And one of the things that has come out of my researches in the um, putting together the volumes of the Liberty Fund's collected edition is a art- couple of articles he wrote in early 1844 which indicate that he had all his original ideas which appeared in economic harmonies already in his head. And of course the tragedy is that he got distracted so often by journalism and by uh, political activity that he never wrote it out in book form as he originally had planned. This this is one of the great uh, tragedies. If I could borrow a Doctor Who episode in the TARDIS and go back (laughs) to 1848 and talk to Frederick... uh, I would say, look, stop this politics stuff, go back to your ranch in the southwest of France and write this damn book because the future will thank you for it. But he couldn't do that and uh, that's one of the sad things about um, putting together this uh, volume is trying to piece together what his overall plan for this multi-volume book on economic harmonies and economic disharmonies would have looked like. The other factor that I have to mention, he's doing all this and he's dying of cancer. I think it's throat cancer, given the descriptions uh, of his condition in his correspondence. So he's in chronic pain. He's coughing up blood. He's probably... The the, the drug of the day was laudanum, which is the morphine. And he would have had a little jar of laudanum and he would have been sipping that constantly during the day to try and uh, keep the pain at bay. It's under these circumstances that he wrote um, the first part of the Economic Harmonies, which he published in his own lifetime in early 1850. And he dies at the end of 1850, and his friends and colleagues put together from his uh, unfinished papers this second edition, which has an extra 15 chapters, but many of those chapters are not real chapters, they're just sketches and drafts and and, uh, sort of off-the-cuff musings. Um, And they published that in 1851. And that's the edition that we have always thought of as the economic harmonies. There was an English translation in the 1860s and 70s. There was a fee translation in the 1960s. And now I hope we have the definitive scholarly edition um, that uh, I have helped uh, uh, collect and put together. So that's the sort of background to this uh, mega project that he had. His plans for this multi-volume work, um, I've been able to, I've tried to reconstruct by reading his correspondence and also some of the obscure references in footnotes scattered through his writings and also sometimes the inserts put into the text by the uh, French editors of the collected works that were published in the 1860s. And um, this is how I see his magnum opus um, being structured. His original plan was to have a volume on what he called the social harmonies. This would deal with human relationships in general and institutions, uh, uh, social institutions, political institutions, um, and some economic institutions. And he would do this in a very general way. And I'll give you a list of some of the topics that he had in mind. Then he thought he needed a separate volume which would deal with a subset of this larger social harmonies And this would be the economic harmonies. And he would deal with this in much more detail, dealing with both theory and economic policy. And that's sort of roughly what we see in the enlarged edition of the economic harmonies. But he also wanted to write, if you like, the other side of the coin, right? Because when you look look around the world, obviously there is a lot of disharmony. And he was criticised at the time by people who said, well, why are you talking about harmonies? Um, There are no harmonies. Uh, Free markets and capitalism and competition lead to disharmony. How can there be harmonies? And so he wanted to explain how um, disharmony came about. And basically his argument is the harmony of the market, the harmony of 
voluntary activity and exchanges between ordinary people gets disrupted by violence. This is the major source of disharmony. And this violence can be individual or it can be organised. And when it's organised, it's usually done by the state. And plunder is one of the key ways in which people, the harmony of markets and the harmony of human interactions gets disrupted. And when it's done by the state, he called it legal plunder. And that's one of the things he's most famous for in his essay, uh, The Law, which was one of the last things he wrote in 1850. So he wanted to write a volume, or maybe two volumes, on the kinds of disharmonies which prevented societies and economies from functioning as he thought they should. And as part of this uh, plan for the book on disharmonies, he wanted to write a history of plunder. So this was going to be a kind of sociological and historical analysis of the evolution of European society since the Romans, where he would deal with how plunder has changed over time. Uh, and he gives us a brief sketch of how, what this would uh, look like. But before he died, he died before he could finish even the first part of this large overall plan. So we see a sort of bastardised version of, or an incomplete part. So here's a, a quote from um, one, of his, uh, one of the notes that he wrote that were found in his papers about his master plan. This is Bastiat speaking. I had originally thought to begin with an exposition of the economic harmonies and as a result to treat only purely economic subjects such as value, property, wealth, competition, wages, population, money, credit, and so on. Later, if I had the time and the energy, I would have called the reader's attention to a much larger subject, the social harmonies. It is here that I would have talked about human nature, the driving force of society, and by that he meant self-interest. He thought that was the motor that drove uh, human society. The individual responsibility and social solidarity, and so on. Having conceived the project in this fashion, I had commenced work on it, when I re that, and probably he started, started doing that in 1847 when he started giving some lectures on economics to some law students. Having conceived the project in this fashion, I'd commenced work on it when I realised that it would have been better to merge rather than to separate these two different kinds of approaches. But then logic demands that the study of mankind should, be, should precede that of economics. However, there was not enough time. Yeah. Right? He's involved in politics and he's dying of cancer. And he dies at the age of 49. How I wish I could correct this error in another edition. So some sad thoughts in that, uh, ideas in that uh, quote. And here's another quote from, this was um, a footnote quoted by Payote, who was the editor of the French edition of his collected works in the 1860s. And um, Payote found this in Bastiat's papers. And that's one of the things that, I've tried to do in our edition of the Economic Harmonies is to try and pluck out these scattered references that were inserted by the original French editors and put them together in a more logical order and framework so we can understand Bastiat's thinking. So this is on the history of plunder. Right? This, is, uh, um, he wanted, this was to be a major work on why there is so much disharmony in the world. He says, a very important task to be done for political economy is to write the history of plunder. It is a long history in which from the outset there appear conquests, the migrations of peoples, invasions, and all the disastrous excesses of force in conflict with justice. Living traces of all this still remain today and cause great difficulty for the solution of the questions raised in our century. We will not reach this solution as long as we have not clearly noted in what way, what, in what and how injustice, when making a place for itself amongst us, has gained a foothold in our customs and our laws. And, of course, going back to his notion of legal plunder, he thinks most of what the state does institutionalises plunder, where one group benefits from another at the expense of another. And this is the source of his class analysis of history and of, and of existing his, of present society. So he's a very interesting character because people associate the idea of class analysis with the Marxists. And when you read um, Bastia, if you don't know much about him, you, you read some passages and you say, well, he must be a Marxist. He's talking about class analysis. But he's writing about class analysis exactly at the same time that Marx is writing the um, Communist Manifesto. Um, and it's very interesting to compare the two. And so one of the things I like to do when I'm teaching students is to get them to read something like Bastia's essay, The State or The Law, where he talks about uh, legal plunder, and to read Marx and Engels' 
Communist Manifesto, which was written also in 1848. Um, interesting contrast. Now, one of the things I did in, in editing um, this volume was um, I'm a sort of visual person, and I like to try and visualise concepts in these maps. I call them vocabulary clusters, and uh, it helps me to understand the relation, first of all, the vocabulary that he uses and how, in what context he uses that vocabulary and the relationship between these different categories of, of ideas. And I've, one of the things I've found, um, the fee translation of the economic harmony, one area where I thought it fell down was it was not consistent in the way it translated some of these terms. And I've tried to overcome that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the... This is a bit hard to see in the... It's a bit fuzzy in, the, in this... Uh, or it could be just my glasses, but it looks uh, a bit fuzzy. Um, what I've done is I've shown the difference between disharmony and harmony and the types of phrases uh, in which he uses the term harmony and disharmony. Um, and as you can see, it is a quite sophisticated and quite complex and well-thought-out framework. And that's one of the things I found quite um, admirable about uh, Bastiat's writings. And I've done these um, vocabulary clusters for about half a dozen of his key concepts like class and human action and plunder. And you can find these all on my um, website if you want to pursue that in more detail. I just am throwing it up, uh, up for you to see as a sort of an overview. But I'm, I'll, I'll talk about some of these in a moment. His theory of harmony, <clears throat> this is uh, what he's best known for, he has this uh, polarity of concepts. La harmonie, la discordance. Constantly he juxtaposes harmony and, and dissidence or discordance or disharmony. And he talks about, first of all, the physiological, celestial, providential and human harmonies. One of the things that got him thinking about this was Laplace um, and his writings about the orbits of, I think it was Jupiter and uh, how there is a uh, harmony in the way in which uh, gravitation moves the planets around the sun. Um, he thought there are other examples of harmony in, uh, for example, uh, the study of the human eye, the structures and the, um, the results that come from this very complex uh, uh, organism, the motions of the planets around the sun. And many of the uh, political economists of the 19th century saw economics uh, in, the, in the form of economic laws, just like the laws of gravitation. And you could not ignore these economic laws without suffering the same sorts of consequences that you would suffer if you ignored the law of gravitation and jumped off a building. Um, so this is a, an idea which is uh, deeply embedded in the classical economists of, of the day. But there's also harmony, he thought, in the human um, world. And the orders that... Uh, he also mixes the term order and harmony together. Um, that there were two types. There were social harmonies and economic harmonies. And these were things that could be observed by economists and historians. And that's why he thought history and economics were so important uh, that historians, uh, historians could, fight, could provide the data that historians could, uh, economists could then use uh, in addition to what they observed in the world around them at the moment they could then compare that with this uh, economic activity in the past and try to understand these laws uh, better. And some of these uh, harmonies or these uh, constants in human activity were things like the universal existence of, of markets, the tendency of humans to engage in transactions and trades with each, each other, very similar to um, Adam Smith's idea about the uh, tendency of people to truck and barter with each other. He uh, had this Hayekian notion of um, spontaneous orders, although he called them natural organisations. Natural organisations were things that were voluntarily uh, emerge when people engage in trade and uh, just living next door to each other and engaging in, in, in ongoing relationships with each other. These might be legal, or they might be religious, or they might just be social in some way. And these were all spontaneous natural organisations. Another uh, source of, uh, of harmony of these uh, constants or uh, laws, if you like, in human behaviour, he thought were 
discoverable, discoverable by a process of internal reflection, since all human beings were thinking, choosing and acting individuals. And as soon as I read that word, acting individuals, I think of Austrian economics and Ludwig von Mises. And uh, this was something, again, that the fee translation didn't pick up, pro possibly because they were working in the pre-computer um, era. And one of the things I was able to do was put together in one file a digital collection of Bastiat's entire works in French. That was over a million and a, million and a quarter words. And you could do keyword searches. Right? So you could look for um, various versions of the, word, the verb to act or acting or whatever, and you could find... His, the first time he started using these terms and then how they were evolved over time and see the clusterings around those words with, related to other words. Um, and I had one, of the, one of the glossaries I wrote for this volume on, of the economic harmonies was on his use of the concept of human action. And I've included that in my paper, which is online. It's really, really interesting and shows, I think, or is an ex evidence of one reason why uh, Bastiat had such an influence on Murray Rothbard. Rothbard too, when he was reading Bastiat in the 18, uh, sorry, in the 1950s, uh, he too saw these words and said, "Ah, oh, yes, that's Austrian analysis. So uh, this man is ahead of his time by at least 20 years, because it's not until the 1870s that the Austrian school really begins to emerge and to um, carve out a, a niche of its own in, in uh, the tradition, history of economic thought." Now, Bastiat thought that obviously harmony could be disrupted, but he said if um, he, he put it in, in a sort of conditional phrase form, if something happens, then something else will happen. So he understood that harmony would flourish or could flourish when individuals understood their rightly, under, their rightly under, understood um, interests. Right? People could make mistakes. They could do stupid things. They could uh, not, not follow the laws of economics that if people were responsible for their own actions, they would learn if they made mistakes, they would correct those, that bad, um, that bad uh, behaviour, and if there was an absence of violence, force and fraud. Now, this is one of the crucial conditions. Now, he thought that there were lots of things that would either cause harmony or would promote harmony. And I won't go into all the details because um, there, are, there are quite a few of them, as you can see. I've already mentioned right, rightly understood uh, interests, being responsible for one's own actions. But most importantly is this uh, fourth one, the mutually beneficial nature of voluntary exchanges. Bastiat is constantly harping on the fact that economic activity is not a zero-sum game, that when people engage in voluntary transactions with each other, both parties gain. And he thought this was a, a strong reason why economic activity creates harmony. It's harmonious because it works, because people benefit from being around other people who are willing to trade with them and being around other people who are prospering. The reason why, one reason why you don't rob your neighbour is because you want your neighbour to be wealthy enough to buy what you produce. I'll skip the rest and go down to the bottom one. Another very interesting um, thing I found in reading um, Bastiat's writings was not only did he have these arguments about harmony, but these arguments about what happens when harmony is disturbed. And he, he had a whole list of what he called disturbing factors, les forces perturbatrices. What happens is the economy is sort of self-correcting or self-healing, so that when something happens to disrupt economic activity, to disrupt the natural harmony of free people going about their business, forces operate, come into play to restore the harmony. And I'll t tell you about some of those uh, in a moment. They're very interesting. Here's a quotation about his um, arguments uh, about rightly understood interests, which he thinks is one of the key factors in understanding why there is harmonious behaviour. Does experience not confirm for us this truth that men have all the more opportunities of prospering themselves, the more prosperous their surroundings are? Of all the harmonies about which I have written, this is certainly the most important, the finest, the most decisive and the most fruitful. It implies and encompasses all the others. For this reason, I can provide only a very inadequate vindication of it here. It will be fortunate if it emanates from the spirit of this book. It will also be fortunate if it emerges at least with a sufficient degree of likelihood 
to persuade the reader to achieve certainty about this through their own efforts. For there should be no doubt that this is the reason for deciding between a natural form of organisation and the artificial ones. It is here and only here that the social question lies. If the prosperity of all is the condition for the prosperity of each person, we can rely not only on the economic power of free trade, but also on its moral force. It will be enough for men to understand where their true interests lie, for trade restrictions, industrial jealousy, trade wars and monopoly to fall under the protests of public opinion. He had a very strong belief that public opinion could change the tide and change the way governments behaved. It will be enough for people to ask not, what will I get out of this, but what will the community get out of this? Before demanding this or that measure from the government, I admit um, that the second of these questions is sometimes asked through the principle of fellow feeling, but just let light be shed on it and it will also be asked out of self-interest. At this point, it would be true to say that the twin driving forces of our nature contribute to the same result, namely the general good, and it would be impossible to, to deny the moral power which self-interest has in both giving rise to many transactions as well as the effects these transactions produce. And continuing on in this very important uh, passage, whether we consider relations in terms of man to man, family to family, province to province, nation to nation, hemisphere to hemisphere, capitalist to worker or factory owner to proletarian, I think it obvious that the social question, and this was a, a, a reference to the demands of socialists to reform uh, society, they called that the social question, why, why is there poverty amongst the workers? I think it obvious that the social question cannot be solved nor even touched on from any point of view without our first making a choice between the following two maxims. One man's profit is another man's loss. One man's profit is another man's profit. For if nature has arranged things in such a way that conflict is the law that governs free transactions, our sole resource, recourse is to, rec is to conquer nature and stifle freedom. If on the other hand, these free transactions are harmonious, that is to say, they tend to improve our conditions and make them more equal. Our efforts ought to be limited to allowing nature to, to be free to act and maintaining the rights of human freedom. That comes from chapter four in our version of the, the traditional version of economic uh, harmonies uh, on, on exchange. Now let me say something briefly about the other side of the coin, his theory of disharmony. And this is what he never was able to put together in a coherent form in a separate volume before he died. He says, disharmony occurs when natural laws are ignored or violated by things such as igno individual ignorance. So people have a responsibility to understand their interests correctly, um, to respect the rights of others and to engage in um, voluntary transactions with others. Uh, if they don't do that, they are either being stupid or they're being willful. Um, it could also come from the use of force or fraud. I've talked already about um, legal plunder, but he also talked about extra legal plunder. That is normal, your normal criminal activity, everyday criminal activity done by people who are criminals, highwaymen, robbers, and so on. But he says that's fairly trivial in the total amount of plunder that goes on. Much more important that, uh, is the amount of legal plunder that is plunder organised by the state. Another major source of disharmony, apart from legal plunder, taking people's stuff is government intervention in the economy, such as tariffs, which was one of his main concerns in, in the free trade movement, subsidies to protect it, or to uh, favoured industries, regulations, and so on. And in his theory, he had a very interesting um, notion of what he calls displacement, um, which is a, a bit like the Austrian theory of the misallocation of resources. He thought that things like um, tariffs and subsidies to favoured industries caused investment in particular factories and the employment of labor, laborers in a particular location uh, were unjustified economically because they were subsidized by the state or protected by the state. And when the, and there was an economic downturn or when the state stopped subsidizing or stopped imposing the tariffs, there would be a correction and the, the, the factory would have to close down and the workers would lose their jobs. And he called these um, uh, dislocations. And he thought this was a major cause of disharmony, uh, the, uh, disruptions caused by government intervention in the economy. He also argues that uh, intervention, oh sorry, harmony is not inherent in human society and that it could be avoided 
And this is the, his if-then argument, his conditional argument. If certain conditions are met, if economic laws are understood and individuals understand their rightly understood and legitimate interests and the property rights of indi individuals are respected and there is no or very minimal force and fraud, then a harmonious social and economic order will eventually emerge. So it's conditional. If these things don't happen, then we will have disharmony and it will, this, this, harmony, this harmony will continue until such time as these measures are withdrawn. So things that promote disharmony, individual ignorance, the use of force or fraud, protectionism, government intervention, and then various historical forms of plunder, which is my last uh, item here on the list. His analysis of this was to comprise a separate volume on the history of plunder. And he saw uh, societies moving through various historical stages. So and again, he's a bit like the Marxists who argue that history moved through you know, slavery, serfdom, um, and then capitalism, and then ultimately to socialism and communism. Um, Bastia also has a kind of stage theory, but this is a stage theory of plunder. And the stages are, and I'll just, just briefly mention them here, war, slavery, theocracy, monopoly, socialism, the modern regulatory state. And this one is something that I don't think many people know about. He had a whole theory about what he called functionaryism. Uh, and what I see when I read this is public choice, right? He says that uh, politicians and bureaucrats are not disinterested uh, parties in, in economics or politics. They have self-interest which they pursue, often at the expense of consumers and taxpayers. And so he was quite interested in exploring how functionaryism or the interests of those who regulate us um, disrupt the economy. So again, he's not only sort of a proto-Austrian in many of his insights, but he's also a proto uh, public choice theorist. So here's a quotation um, about disturbing factors in displacement. Right? He thought that there were things that disrupted the, uh, the economy um, and that caused um, disruption, disharmony, plunder, theft, misery, poverty, and so on. Here's a, an interesting passage. This intervention of force in human transactions is followed by countless harms. The increase in the size of this force, that is government, is itself already an initial harm, for it is perfectly clear that the state cannot make conquests, keep distant countries under its domination, and divert the natural course of trade through the activities of the customs service without greatly increasing the number of its agents. Right? The state gets bigger. This diversion of the coercive power of the state from its proper purpose is an evil even greater than its increase. The rational purpose of government is to protect all forms of freedom and property, and here we find it applied to violating the freedom of property of its citizens. When they act like this, uh, this government seems bent on removing from people's minds any principled notions at all. As soon as it is accepted that oppression and plunder are legitimate because they are legal, provided that they are carried out on the citizens only through the intermediary of the law and the coercive power of the state, gradually we begin to see each class stepping toward stepping forward to demand that all the other classes be sacrificed to it. Whether the intervention of this coercive power in exchanges stimulates some exchanges uh, sorry, uh, that would never have been made or prevents some that would have been made, it cannot fail to cause the simultaneous loss or displacement of labour and capital. So here's an opportunity cost uh, argument here that some government interventions causes some things to happen and prevent others from that might have happened. Um, natural inter interests uh, disappear at one place, artificial interests are created at another and people are forced to follow the flow of these opposing interests. This is the reason why we see huge industries established in places where they should never be, such as France making sugar and England spinning cotton imported from the plains of India. Centuries of wars have been necessary, rivers of blood spilt and huge amounts of treasure wasted to achieve the result of substituting unsound industries for sound ones in Europe, thus creating opportunities for crises, unemployment, instability, and finally, pauperism. That also comes from his essay on, or his chapter on exchange. So here is a summary of um, my attempt to reconstruct his multi-volume work on the harmonies and the disharmonies. And what I have in brackets are the relevant chapters in Economic Harmonies where he, some of this material appears um, and there's also other works uh, 
uh, other writings that he did uh, where he treats these topics. Now, this um, part of this and a list of things that were meant to be part of a bigger project uh, does appear in the middle of uh, the economic harmonies that we know. Uh, the editor, Prosper Payote, inserted his uh, attempt to reconstruct this uh, by, uh, from Bastiat's papers, but even Payote's uh, attempt, I think, was incomplete. So he wanted something on the social harmonies, a book on the... And this was to be... The first chapter would be on uh, fellow feeling and the principle of individualism. He wanted to talk about individual responsibility, but also the feelings of solidarity that people have towards each other. This was his attempt to counter some of the socialist critiques that uh, the free market people were insensitive to others. Um, the importance of self-interest, uh, which was the driving force of, of all human activity, he thought. He argued also about per that human beings were perfectible, and so were societies. Um, he, was, he wanted to write a lot more about public opinion and the power that it would have in changing not only changing society, but also in, prevent, in encouraging people to behave well towards each other. Right? There was social ostracism if you, you know, mistreated your neighbours by your other neighbours. Um, he, a, a, he wanted to write stuff on liberty and equality, and then morality, politics, religion, and so on. So this is just a very sketchy outline of what he wanted to include in this never-written volume. The second volume was to be on economic harmonies, and this would have two components, I think. One on theoretical matters, and a lot of these appear in, in uh, the economic harmonies edition that we know, um, like exchange, value, wealth, capital, private property, competition, and so on. He also wanted to have something about policy matters, and um, much of this comes is reconstructed from his correspondence, but also uh, some of the essays that he wrote um, for either in uh, what is seen and what is not seen, which is the acronym WS, WNS, or from some of the economic sophisms. So he wanted to talk about money, credit, wages, savings, population, machines, and machines, which was a big social question of the day because they were putting workers out of work. And then um, the one, the volume that was um, never written, History of Plunder. He has um, various sketches of this in the economic, in the economic sophism. The nature of plunder, the two means of acquiring wealth. There was one, either production or confiscation or plunder. War, slavery, theocracy, monopoly, and so on. So these are some of the other vocabulary clusters that you can find on my website. This is the one to do with class and how the plunderers plunder are the, uh, is one class and those who are plundered is another class. That's the simplification of it. Human action, there's a huge collection of words and phrases that he uses to describe this very Austrian notion of human action. And then plunder, there was meant to be an entire volume written about this and this is a summary of all his different thoughts. So that's the end of my <laughs> formal <laughs> remarks. Uh, we have 10 minutes in which to uh, discuss things and ask questions and I'm very happy to, to do that. Thank you.